Okay, this will be a continual verse-by-verse study through Revelation. This will be on the church of the Laodiceans. It's found in Revelation 3, 14 to 22. There's a lot of information here. Uh, I'll try to cover as best I can in a short amount of time. You can always pause the video if you'd like. Uh, now, Laodiceans, uh, if you look on the map, uh, the last map in the Common Man's Reference Bible, you'll see that there's Laodicea, and then a little bit south of it is a place called Colossae. Okay, that's the epistle to the Colossians. And it's interesting that the word Laodiceans and Laodicea are found seven times in the Bible. Twice here in Revelation, five times times in Colossians. And so what we're going to see is that Colossians, that little four-chaptered letter, is going to deal with pertinent information for the church just prior to the uh, rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture. So you're going to see that, uh, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Now that right there is what's killing uh, the faith in many churches in philosophy where the average pastor is nothing but a, an amateur psychologist. So uh, this church of Laodicea was obviously a church back in the day. It uh, may be a, a small church during the tribulation time period. It will appear that's what it's going to be. And it may be a select time period in the church period church age. I'm not going to be dogmatic on it, but it does appear, it does hold a lot of characteristics of the church, the general church body uh, in America in the 20th century going into the 21st century. So verse 14, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. Okay, we know that's Jesus, the beginning of the creation of God. So right there, that little statement uh, foolish um, Arians, foolish Arians going to wrestle with that phrase, the beginning of the creation of God, and then they're going to try to tell you that Jesus Christ is the first uh, one created by God, hence he is a created God, okay? And they're going to use it, you see, the beginning of the creation of God, he was first one created. Uh, well, <laughs> no, he is not the object being created. He is the subject of the creation. Okay, so this uh, crazy idea that Jesus is a begotten or created God is unfortunately supported by a few of the new Bibles, and it's just utter nonsense. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. I covered that back in chapter 1, verse 8. And then he says this, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now that, that would, uh, an Arminian would jump all over that. I will spew thee out of my mouth. See, see, you're lost. You're going to hell. You lost your salvation. When an Arminian pastor doesn't believe he can lose his salvation, he believes his people can, but he can't. Jimmy Swagger years ago, he didn't lose his salvation when he was caught, you know, eh, eh, doing certain things. And Jimmy Baker, he didn't lose his salvation, or Roberts didn't lose his, you know, when he built the hall of you know the hospital, revealing he don't have faith. No, I actually had one of these, uh, two of these fellers in, a, you know, in a prison ministry, and they tried to tell a young man that I was discipling that he could lose his salvation. Told him for an hour that he could lose his salvation, and then he turned around and asked them how many times they lost theirs, and then they said, "Never, I can't," and then he said, "Well, then you lied to me for an hour, and that's a fact." Okay, now, what is this cold, hot, and lukewarm thing? Now, I, most, most will teach that hot is you're on fire for God, cold is you're in the world, and not where you're supposed to be. Lukewarm is you're half world, half God. Now, I don't teach it that way. And the reason why I don't teach it that way is because of the statement where Jesus said, I would thou wert cold or hot. 
I don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ wants any of his children to be in the world and act like the world and love the world and things like that. What is, going, what is this idea between cold, hot, and lukewarm? So I'm going to go with the obvious and work uh, um, out from that, the obvious. That's always the best way to go. You start with the clear, and then you go to the complex. And I would dare say a lukewarm person is the one that obviously is the one in trouble, and he's going to be described in verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not. Okay, need of nothing. Right there would help, you know, clarify the lukewarm individual. If you do not feel like you need anything, then you're satisfied. A lukewarm individual is somebody who is satisfied <coughs> with themselves because they have need of nothing, unfortunately, including God. Lukewarmness produces a stale and stagnant person. People sometimes use the illustration, if you drink lukewarm water, you will throw up. No, you won't. In fact, that's Really, the most healthy water to drink is lukewarm water, not from the city tap with the chlorine and fluoride. Uh, and, you know, rainwater probably would be the best. If you'd want to filter, it would be a good idea. Okay, but uh, lukewarm water is actually very good for the body. Now, what kind of water would be lukewarm that would make you sick? And that would be stagnant water. You take hikes up in the mountains, you might find in a little crevice of a rock some green, green looking water. It's got goobers in there, about like, you know, a little kid drank out of the bottle and back, you know, back washed into it. Uh, that stag that's stagnant water. Now, that stagnant water is full of bacteria and germs. Stagnant believers will degenerate into apathy, apostasy. Anarchy against a true authority. The ones on fire for God are not satisfied with their abilities, their accomplishments, their growth, their knowledge, their righteousness, their service. Why? There's always room for improvement. The psalmist said in Psalm 17, 15, he said, I will be satisfied when I am like thee. That's when we can be satisfied. Now, we can be satisfied with our salvation. We can be content with our circumstances. But a great, a great athlete is never satisfied with his game. He is always seeking to improve his game. Okay, you can be content with your position of possessions. Okay, but you want to grow, continually grow in any area of life. So if... The lukewarm individual is satisfied, and the hot individual is unsatisfied, meaning they're going to continue to grow, continue to move forward. What is this cold party? Okay, this cold party has got to be in a position where the Lord said, I would thou work cold or hot. What is that cold? It's got to be something that's acceptable or allowed by the Lord but he doesn't want us to stay in that uh, setting real long. You ever hear somebody say, man, I got cold feet about that? Or does somebody ever give you a cold shoulder? You see, where a lukewarm individual is unsatis or satisfied with themselves, a hot is somebody who is unsatisfied. They're continuing to grow. A cold person is dissatisfied. That means something like they're not certain something's wrong, but they don't know what it is. Okay, many a men sitting in a church and a wife is, you know, enjoying the church and he's like, this, this guy don't believe what he says. There's many people in America that uh, can see that it doesn't matter if you vote or not. Things don't usually change. 
Okay, now this president we have now is one of the first that has kept his promises in my lifetime, or at least tried to, and has spoken honestly about the media. But why is it the majority of Americans who can vote don't vote? It's because they're dissatisfied with the politicians, you know, and, and they feel nothing changes. And so why? They give up. Coldness is a dissatisfaction with a belief, a person, or a situation. It's like the men that came to David when he was out in the wilderness, it says they were in debt, they were in distress, okay, and they were discontented. They knew Saul was a liar. They didn't want to follow him. They couldn't put their finger on it. You see, the Lord doesn't mind if you're, if you're cold, cold shoulder. He wants you to figure out what the problem is and then become hot. Because if you take a cold glass of water and set it on your table, eventually it's going to gravitate towards lukewarm. So to be cold or dissatisfied is acceptable for a short time, you know, where a person can figure it out what the problem is. He can be cautious and suspicious. Patrick Henry said, suspicion is a virtue, not a vice. But he should use his uncertainty, not use it for a lame excuse for his apathy or laziness, he should use it to seek after the truth until he gets the answer. Now, the Spirit of God, if he does for you what he's done for me on many occasions, where I was uncertain about some things, it's like the Spirit would throw up a warning flag. And it's like, pay attention, be watching here. And then usually within a week, he'll give me the truth about it, and then I'll be thrilled and excited. I went through that about the King James Bible. You know, I went to... A school that uh, promoted the new Bibles for a couple of years. And after a couple of years of that, I started thinking, man, oh man, which Bible do I memorize? And I felt, man, I'm not going to memorize anything. And I just stuck with it. And God, in His graciousness, revealed to me, hey, you need to do a research on this book. Is this book true or not? And so I started writing schools. And boy, did I learn something. And boy, when I discovered that, book, that old King James Bible, is the absolute word of God, pure, and the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. Man, I got excited, and I've been excited ever since. So this lukewarm attitude, spirit, has encompassed the church today. And if you talk to the Christians going to these churches, the people, they say, well, look at our church. Man, we're so rich. We got a great work for God. Look how big we are. Well, the Lion King in the Vatican's got everybody beat. If numbers, if you think that gain is godliness, he says, this Christian, today, well, I'm increased with goods. I don't need anything. Yeah, you don't even need God either because in verse 20, Jesus is standing outside the church door. Now, this idea of spewing them out of his mouth, that does cause a problem for one who believes in eternal security. If, if you're going to try to pull this passage back into the Pauline epistles. If you leave it set to where it's supposed to be, it don't cause a problem at all. This is why the believers in the tribulation time period are warned over and over in Hebrews, in James, in 1 Peter, in 1 John, Jude, and Revelation that you're going to have to hold out to the end. Because the Lord has unfinished business with Israel in the 70 weeks. And the first 69 operated under the Mosaic Covenant. And so will that final week. And that's why Hebrews writes about the Mosaic Covenant so much. Because he's talking to Hebrews. And they will be living during the last days. So if you keep it within its setting, no problem at all. So here's the advice the Lord Jesus Christ says to the Laodicean Christian. He says, And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind 
and naked. That is the general description by the Lord Jesus Christ of the average church in America today. Wretched, the scandals that goes on in church, miserable. You'll find some of the people, many of the people in a church are just miserable. Poor, not poor financially because they're increased with goods and rich, but they're poor in the work of God. Blind, they don't know squat. They limit the Bible to the fundamentals. Oh, fundamental, some small little thing. Oh, this is all we're going to teach right here. This little bit. Oh, little. Oh, no. Oh, right there. The average sermon today is nothing but pablum puke. It's nothing but amateur psychology. It's not even the milk of the word. It's a combination of trying to entertain a bunch of carnal people. So here's what the Lord says you should be doing. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in a fire. Okay, the gold is a trial of your faith. That thou mayest be rich, rich in faith. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. White raiment, if you go to 2 Corinthians 5, is referring to personal righteousness. You need to live a holy life. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes salve that thou mayest see. Anoint thine eyes with eyes. I, do, I believe that is the greatest prayer that you can pray. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Paul gave a very long prayer in, about that in Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. And in verse 18, the heart of that prayer is enlightened eyes. He did it in Colossians also, the same idea. Long prayer, enlightened eyes. An eye-opening ministry. That's what the Bible should be to you. An eye-opener. It should open your eyes about everything that's going on in your life. Every single thing your conscience should be alert. I mean, anybody that's reading the Bible, anybody that's reading the Bible, and knows anything about God and the Bible, do you think they'd vote for Biden? You say, well, I don't like Trump. Biden? No, partial birth abortion. Do you know what partial birth abortion is? It's when a baby is born feet first, and right before the head comes out, they put something in the back of the head and, and kill that baby. That's, what, that is the, that's one of the promoted stands of the Democratic party and you're a christian and you're gonna vote for something like that i don't know about you i can't i won't he says anoint thine eyes with eyes salve you gotta have opened eyes to see these things and then the lord says as many as i love i rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore repent and then the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This is a one time where church possibly has a building in the Bible. And notice Jesus is outside of the building trying to knock on the building to come in to preach to these people. And they don't want to hear it. And notice the Lord's not real optimistic because he says, If any man hear my voice voice if 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 and this is a day and age where the lord is dealing with the individual national revival for america i'm not holding my breath on it sure i pray for things like that but this country with all the abortions and the transgender movement and what's going on in this country we don't deserve it May God have mercy on this country. Where the Democratic Party, when they say the Pledge of Allegiance, they omit under God. Why? Because Romans 1 says they don't like to retain God in their knowledge. They omit that. And did you see the Democratic uh, symbol this year where they have an inverted pentagram pointing to two, pointing to zero? Inside the zero is a picture of America, the mainland. And so in essence, that, what that's saying, that's Baphomet. That is basically saying death to America. That's really what they're trying to promote. That's what it looks like to me. 
In this day and age, a man who is cold, where he is, knows something's wrong in his church and knows something's not right, and when he goes to God's face and seeks for the truth and God enlightens him, verse 20 says, the Lord will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You have personal fellowship. And then it says in 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, doctrinally, that is available for a born-again believer, but this, I dare say, is dealing with a Jewish believer of the tribulation. Generally, that's what you're going to find from Hebrews to the end of the Bible. Sure, you're going to find some things filtered or about the church filtered in there, intermingled in there, here and there. But generally, he's talking to Jewish believers. And then he closed it out as he did with every one of them. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So the Spirit of God will guide that individual believer who is cold to research and study and discover what is wrong because he's dissatisfied. He knows something wrong, but he can't figure it out. And then when he seeks God's face, seeks the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ will come into him and he'll show him and then he can get on fire for God. I mean, are you satisfied with your life? You're Laodicea. Always room for growth, always room for perfection, always room for improvement. Okay, and so that's what the Lord desires from us.